Good morning, Europe. Welcome to the program. Our top stories for you this hour. Nerve agent strikes again. A couple are in critical condition in England after being exposed to the same nerve agent that poisoned the ex-Russian spy Sergei Skripal. And over in the cube, our social media news desk. We've been looking into what we can find out about who these people are and if there's any connection with the other poisoning of Novichok earlier this year. In good spirits, the boys trapped in a Thai cave appear in a new video smiling and getting treated as rescue teams work on how to get them out. Poland crisis? As protests continue against judicial reforms, we speak to a Polish judge about what the changes mean for the country. And how far would you go to protest? Well, one woman scaled the Statue of Liberty to protest migrant family separations. Thank you for starting your day with us. Our top story today, a new twist to a growing poisoning mystery. Two British citizens are critically ill after they were exposed to what authorities say is the same nerve agent that struck a former Russian spy and his daughter in March. Well, even more troubling, this new poisoning happened just a few kilometers away from Salisbury, where Sergei and Yulia Skripal were attacked. Our correspondent Vincent McAvinney is at the scene in the town of Amesbury. Vincent, what do we know uh, about this couple and the condition? that they're in at the moment. Good morning, Tessa. Well, this is the house in Amesbury that the couple were found at on Saturday. Initially, it was thought they might have taken a bad batch of drugs. Paramedics took them to the same hospital that treated Sergei and Yulia Skripal about eight miles from here, and it was discovered that they too had been poisoned. Now, this house is under police cordon, along with a number of sites in this town, including the local Boots and Baptist Centre, as they try to trace the couple's movement. Another site in Salisbury also sealed off as this investigation rapidly expands. The poisoning of a couple in Wiltshire was caused by the nerve agent Novichok, the same substance used against a former Russian spy and his daughter four months ago. The couple, believed to be Charlie Rowley and Dawn Sturgis, are said to be in a critical condition. They were hospitalised after being found unwell on Saturday in Amesbury, just miles away from Salisbury, where ex-double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia were attacked in March. Britain's counter-terrorism policing network is now leading the investigation. Good evening, thanks for your patience. Following the detailed analysis of those samples, we can confirm that the man and woman have been exposed to the nerve agent Novichok, which has been identified as the same nerve agent that contaminated both Yulia and Sergei Skripal. However, I must say that we are not in a position to say whether the nerve agent was from the same batch that the Scripples were exposed to. The March attack prompted the biggest Western expulsion of Russian diplomats since the Cold War. Allies in Europe and the United States sided with Prime Minister Theresa May's view that Moscow was either responsible or had lost control of the nerve agent. Now, Vincent, uh, obviously a second case of poisoning is very troubling. Do we know any more, it's still early days in the investigation, um, whether or not this could indeed be from that same batch uh, of Novichok used in an earlier poisoning, although the police can't confirm yet? What do you know? Well, last night, Met Police Assistant Commissioner Neil Basu, who you heard from there, said that there was nothing in the background of this couple to suggest why they might have been attacked. So the prevailing theory is that the Novichok that was used in that last attack against Sergei and Yulia Skripal, somewhere some of it had been stashed or thrown, and this couple have come into contact with it and suffered the same effects. Now, that is only a theory at the moment. It's unclear. But as the police said, they couldn't find a sort of clear link as to why so far this couple might have been attacked. They did say they also can't confirm if it's the exact same batch, only that Porton Down had identified it as the same chemical. Now, people here that I've spoken to are very nervous and scared uh, about this having happened again. As I said previously, a number of sites will have been closed down, and the advice last night from the England Chief Medical Officer, Sally Davies, was that anyone in the sites that I mentioned from about 8 p.m. onwards on Friday should do the 
the same as they did last time. They should wash any clothes, any items that they had with them, and then dispose of what you've washed them with, if you use wipes or anything like that. They're saying that no one else has reported any signs or symptoms yet. There will be increased security and police presence in this area. Last night I was in Salisbury. The sites there, the ZZ restaurant, the Bishop's Mill pub, are still shut down. They've got cordons around them and security around them. So people here are used to this kind of presence, but they are still scared at this latest turn of events. There were two COBRA meetings yesterday, the government's emergency committee, and there'll be another one held later on today. All right, thank you for that update. Uh, for now, Vincent McAvinney reporting there from Amesbury. Thanks. Well, as we said earlier, still early days into the investigation, a lot of confusion, a lot of questions. Is there a link between this poisoning and the case earlier this year? Well, Alex and the Cube team have been investigating. Alex. Morning, Tessa. Yes, well, I, I would bet that most of us have never heard of the word Novichok or what a Novichok was until March this year. And yet now we've had another case of a Novichok poisoning. Well, our team here in the Cube this morning have been looking through to see who these latest victims are and if there could be any connection with Sergei and Yulia Skripal. Let's firstly just walk you through where all this took place. It's all taking place in Wiltshire in England. This latest couple fell ill in Amesbury, this town up here. Uh, they fell ill on Saturday night and were found unconscious in a property. Uh, initially, police thought they'd taken contaminated drugs. Obviously, now we know they were poisoned by Novichok. Now, the other poisoning took place roughly 13 kilometres. This is where uh, Sergei and Yulia Skripal fell ill in Salisbury. They fell ill in a uh, ZZ Italian restaurant before collapsing on a bench outside. Now, many sites in Salisbury we've seen were cordoned off by police. That bench was eventually removed and a decontamination process was going on. But at the moment, as you can see, another couple now from the area, very near in terms of um, geography, have now fallen ill as a result of Novichok. So who are these people and is there any connection? Well, this morning we've been going through and looking at their public social media presence and seeing if there is any connection with Sergei or Yulia Skripal. The first point to make, I think, is that uh, let's remind ourselves of who Sergei and Yulia Skripal were, the faces of the last two victims of Novichok poisoning, the former Russian spy and his daughter. Well, Yulia, Yulia Skripal does have a Facebook presence, so we were able to run through this morning and have a look to see if there were any connections between this latest couple and Yulia. Now, Facebook, to the best that we can find, shows no social media connections between Yulia and this couple. They seem to very much be a local couple based on their social media posts. Obviously, that is based just on what is on Facebook. So let's take a look uh, at uh, the latest couple um, here. I'll pull this up for you. This. These are the faces of the latest couple who've fallen ill. This uh, here, Charlie Rowley and uh, Dawn Sturgis here. Now, their relationship has been listed publicly on Facebook since roughly February 2007 last year. And in a public Facebook post, Dawn describes Charlie as a local boy. So there are social posts where the two are connected, public social posts. Um, we also know that um, a, a friend claiming to be an ex of one of these two has posted about her concern for the couple now they have fallen ill. But at this stage, as Terrorism Police uh, UK, Terrorism Police in the UK have been saying, it's very important not to go beyond what we are seeing. You will see a lot of information in your social media feeds, a lot of conspiracy theories. But the police are saying it is important that, yes, while we notice that this is all taking place in Wiltshire, we do not go above and beyond the evidence and the investigation. So we in the Cube will do our best to make sure we bring you the latest as it happens and as it is confirmed. Tessa. All right. Thank you for keeping an eye on that. Alex and the Cube team. Thanks. Now to Thailand. Thai Navy SEALs have released fresh video from inside the cave where 12 boys and their football coach have been trapped underground for more than a week and a half. Well, they appear tired but in good spirits as medical experts carry out checkups. The boys introduce themselves one by one and reassure their families that they're in relatively good health. Well, Thai authorities say that they're exploring the best way to bring all the boys and their coach out safely, but this may mean they're not able to all leave at the same time. Even Laverick has a story. Rescue teams in Thailand are giving crash courses in swimming and diving as part of preparations to extract 12 trapped boys and their young football coach from a flooded cave. But those faced with trying to get the boys out refuse to be hurried. They have a number of options and daren't risk choosing the wrong one. Pumps are working around the clock to try to control water levels with the rainy season having just begun. Photographs posted on social media by Thai Navy SEALs show their members working in chest-deep water as they pump water as fast as possible. 
But if the diving option is chosen, some of the route out would involve squeezing through tight gaps underwater, and in parts it's too narrow to wear an oxygen tank, and it would easily cause a child to panic. Videos of the boys show that divers, doctors and counsellors have now joined them, providing them with company, food and medicines. Before they were found, they would have been in total darkness once any torch batteries had expired. They all appear to be very thin but in good health. They're training as young footballers coming into play. Further, much-needed reassurance was also on hand yesterday. Prayers were offered for a successful rescue. And a group of students who are friends with two of the boys trapped inside the cave sang a song in front of the entrance to show their support. Evelyn Laverick, Euronews. Now, is Poland in crisis? Protests are swelling over sweeping judicial reforms that critics say amount to a power grab by the conservative government. Thousands took to the streets in Warsaw on Wednesday to protest against a new law forcing dozens of top judges into early retirement. The changes introduced mean up to 40 percent of Supreme Court judges are set to lose their jobs. The government says it will help fight corruption, but former President Lech Walesa, who attended one of the protests, said the legislation may, quote, lead to civil war, end quote. Well, for more on this, I'm joined by Vladimir Vrubel, a Supreme Court justice in Poland. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now, we know that there was defiance yesterday from the, uh, the top Supreme Court, the head of the Supreme Court. Is this the general feeling among judges in Poland? Defiance? Yeah, I think so. We are just to protect the Constitution and the regulation of the Constitution and the rule of law. So we are staying in our office, we are uh, performing our duties also. The president of the Supreme Court is doing this. She was welcomed yesterday in the court. And uh, I think in the court now, everything is normal. We will see what will happen the next days. Uh, we are expecting that the tribunal of the European Union will make uh, a verdict on that's what's going on in Poland. Yeah, but according to the government, um, the, you're no longer in, in your post. I mean, those 27 judges are no longer in their post. They said that they're doing this to, to rid the system of links to the communist era. Do you see merit in this argument? No, I don't think so at all. So, you know, uh, the average age of a judge in Poland is 39. So it is not even possible just to be active during the communist time by the judges. And uh, the, the, the biggest threat that we now experience in Poland is the double legal system, that some branches of, of the state power will not recognize the other branches, I mean the judiciary. So this threat is very immense, and as we are also the European judges, that's also a threat for Europe. Uh, how do you see this ending? I mean, we see the protests swelling. You say you're staying in your jobs. The, the, the government says, no, you're no longer in your jobs. So how do you see this ending? Well, I hope that we gain some time. So I, I, I don't think that there is a really um, great uh, conflict in that way that uh, uh, there are some very dramatic events that we expect to happen. We've got some time, just the time to, to uh, ask the, not only European Commission, but especially the Tribunal of the, of the European Union to make a decision over this new statute and over this new modification in, in judiciary system in Poland. All right, thank you very much for your insight. Vlazimierz Vrubel, a Supreme Court justice in Poland. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. And still to come for you in Good Morning Europe, we interview former Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa, who has an arrest warrant out against him in Ecuador over his alleged involvement in an attempt to kidnap a political opponent. And we find out more about the poisoning in the UK and how it is related to the Skripal case earlier this year in Salisbury. That's after a short break. Watching Good Morning Europe, our top story, a new twist to a growing poisoning mystery in the UK. Two British citizens are critically ill after they were exposed to what authorities say is the same nerve agent that struck a former Russian spy and his daughter in March. And even more troubling, this new poisoning happened just a few kilometers away from Salisbury, where Sergei and Yulia Skripal were attacked. 
former Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa has been issued an arrest warrant over an alleged involvement in a 2012 attempt to kidnap a political opponent. Well, Correa, who lives in Belgium now, spoke to our correspondent Brian Carter. A court in Ecuador issued an arrest warrant against the former president, Rafael Correa, who led the country from 2007 to 2017. Correa, who is accused of kidnapping a political opponent in 2012, denies all charges. Euronews met up with him in an apartment close to Brussels, where the former head of state now lives with his Belgian wife and children. What does the President of the Republic have to do with this event? At the beginning, I wasn't even accused. It happened in 2012. In 2013, the alleged victim presented a specific accusation and didn't accuse me. But already in November, they realized that with false testimonies, they could point to the President. And they announced from this moment on, you will see Correa will get an arrest warrant from Interpol. And they started this whole thing, which has no legal or logical basis. Rompiendo toda la legalidad, toda la lógica. Last month, Ecuador's attorney general said he had enough evidence to prosecute Correa. This triggered demonstrations in the streets of Quito in support of the former president, who remains popular among some Ecuadorians for the welfare policies he implemented. The judge in this case argues that Correa did not present himself to the court, as was asked of him, and ordered his arrest. The former president says it was impossible for him to go back to his country and added that the whole case is politically motivated to bar him from playing any role in the future affairs of Ecuador. It hurts me to say this, but Ecuador is seen again as a banana republic. No serious country will take into account an order for detention that is so clearly political, illegal and absurd especially Belgium. But people are very nervous. My friends, my family, our militants, they say there will be a red notice from Interpol. They will capture Correa, extradite him and put him in jail in the Ecuadorian dictatorship. This is not possible. Nothing of this absurdity will happen, especially here in Belgium, where there are a lot of guarantees. We are safe here. Nobody needs to worry about me. We need to worry about the country. The Ecuadorian judge who wants to extradite Correa said Interpol had been informed of the arrest warrant. But the International Police Agency has yet to react officially. And joining us live from Brussels now is a correspondent, Brian Carter. Brian, you met with Correa yesterday, and he claims that the Belgian authorities, they won't take the, the warrant seriously. But uh, what happens next? Good morning, Tessa. I'm standing here in front of the Ecuador consulate in Brussels, where Rafael Correa says he presented himself on Monday to show his will to cooperate with the judicial authorities of Ecuador. It's still uncertain. Uh, how Ecuador will react to this case. They can either seek direct cooperation with Belgium or they can go through Interpol. Now, if they decide to go to Interpol, Interpol will analyze the case based on its own rules and regulations and eventually decide to issue a so-called red notice. Now, a red notice is not an international arrest warrant. It doesn't compel member states to arrest the individual. It merely informs all the, all, it merely informs all the member states of the arrest warrant in a particular country. Now, uh, law experts uh, here in Belgium say that Belgium has a very strong tradition and regulation to protect uh, uh, political uh, dissidents, to protect people that have been politically persecuted. And that's why the lawyer of Mr. Correa and Mr. Correa himself were so confident that this case would not go further and that this is just a political witch hunt. And Mr. Correa even told us during our interview that he saw this as part of a larger crackdown in South America against leftist leaders like himself. So what is still while it is still uncertain what his legal future will be, uh, his political future in Ecuador seems more uncertain than ever. All right, thanks for that. Uh, Brian Carter there in Brussels. Thanks. Now, wildfires in Northern California are threatening nearly 1,000 homes. More than 25,000 hectares of land has been damaged by the blaze as it rips through the Yolo and Napa counties, 80 kilometers north of Sacramento. Evacuations have been ordered in several communities. A rescue ship carrying 60 migrants has arrived in Barcelona after being blocked from entry by Italy and Malta. The open arms ship reached the city after a four-day journey from Libyan waters where it rescued people from a rubber float. Well, they are expected to go through health checks and identification procedures before receiving a 30-day permit to apply for residence in the EU. 
U.S. President Donald Trump celebrated American Independence Day by addressing military families at a White House picnic. Accompanied by First Lady Melania Trump, the president thanked military personnel for their, quote, ultimate sacrifice to keep America free, end quote. Well, the families also enjoyed a concert and a privileged view of the National Mall fireworks from the lawns of the White House. And still to come for you on the program, German Chancellor Angela Merkel denies that she has betrayed her own values on immigration in a TV interview. And over in the queue. Like stopping an ambulance trying to reach a crash, that's what an NGO has said about Malta's stance on their rescues. We'll have that story, but first, a short break. Welcome back to Good Morning Europe Now fresh from an EU summit with a big focus on migration. French President Emmanuel Macron has acknowledged that plans to open migrant processing centers in North Africa are only viable if the host countries drive the process. Well, he made the comment to the BBC as he wrapped up a two-nation African charm offensive, and it seems to have been successful, particularly with Nigeria's youngsters. Our correspondent Anlis Borges traveled with the president, and she sent us this report. Everywhere he went, the scene repeated itself. Everybody wanted a little bit of Emmanuel Macron. He's young and intelligent. The French president's youth struck a chord with the young in Nigeria and in other parts of this corner of the world long ruled by older leaders. For the last day of his eighth African visit, the French president decided to show off on a basketball court. But it wasn't all that bad. My perspective was to enlarge the partnership with Nigeria. We have a very good partnership on, on, on security. But I mean, our common history and our common destiny is not just in security. We have to help Nigeria to succeed and help Nigeria to provide the opportunities to uh, its people. You really struck a chord with the youth. They said you were awesome. Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> they are awesome. I think that's, for me, our challenge is on both sides of the Mediterranean Sea to transform what is an opportunity in the great success. Youth in Africa is an opportunity. For a lot of people in Europe today, it is seen as a threat. This is a mistake. We have to fix the situation and we have to help this new generation to succeed because it will totally transform Africa, believe me. And transforming Africa is precisely what many people here feel Macron has encouraged them to do. So just actually meeting him and like with him actually publicizing my t-shirt was just amazing. I have many dreams, not honestly. Um, I love sports, I also love architecture and I'm a, I'm a very artistic person. So if there's work, I can just combine everything together. When he was elected last year, Emmanuel Macron promised a change in French foreign policy in Africa. And the region seems to be a priority for his government. During this trip, he announced 1 million euros in investment in Nigeria. But for many here, potentially inspiring young Nigerians to change their reality was the real, invaluable part of his visit. Annelise Borges in Lagos, Nigeria, for Euronews. Coming up, we'll look at all of your top stories, including more on that couple that was poisoned by Novichok in England. Now, that is the same nerve agent that was used on the former Russian spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter. So that investigation is continuing. Plus, migration. Angela Merkel, that's the top of her agenda today as she meets with the Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban. And take a look at this. Why is this woman climbing the Statue of Liberty to protest? Well, we'll find out. But first, we'll look at a video, our no comment of today from Thailand. Incredible images again of medics treating those children who were trapped in a cave for 12 days now. Welcome back to Good Morning Europe. Our top stories, a nerve agent strikes again. A couple are in critical condition in England after being exposed to the same nerve agent that poisoned the ex-Russian spy Sergei Skripal. In good spirits, the boys trapped in a Thai cave appear in a new video smiling and getting treated as rescue teams work on how to get them out. 
And how far would you go to protest? Well, one woman scaled the Statue of Liberty to protest migrant family separations. Fresh video has been released from inside the Thai cave where 12 boys and their football coach have been trapped for more than a week and a half. Well, they appear tired but in good spirits as medical experts carry out checkups. The boys introduce themselves one by one and reassure their families that they're in relatively good health. Rescue teams helped by Thai Navy SEALs are preparing crash courses in swimming and diving as a plan is formed to get the group out safely. But Thai authorities say that many factors are in play, meaning they may not all be able to leave at the same time. A British police say a man and woman in critical condition in Wiltshire were poisoned by Novichok. That is the same nerve agent that poisoned a former Russian spy and his daughter earlier this year. Well, this new incident happened in Amesbury. That's just a few kilometers away from Salisbury, where Sergei and Yulia Skripal were stuck in, struck in March. Counterterrorism police are now leading the case, and they say... There's no intelligence at this stage to indicate the couple in Amesbury was deliberately targeted. The man and woman are both British nationals aged in their 40s and they're reportedly, there's reportedly nothing in their background to suggest that they would be a target. Our correspondent uh, Vincent McAvinney is at the scene in the town of Amesbury. Uh, Vincent, what more do we know about uh, this couple and the condition that they're in? Can you update us please? Good morning, Tessa. Well, the couple were found in the home just behind me here. There are police officers outside it, cordon tape across it. It's quiet at the moment, but they've been carrying out investigation work for the last couple of days since the couple were found by paramedics. Initially, it was thought they might have taken a bad batch of drugs, but when they were taken to the same hospital that Yulia and Sergei Skripal were treated, it was discovered that they too had been poisoned. Now, this site, along with the local Boots farm, Pharmacy in the local Baptist Centre and a park in Salisbury have all been sealed off as police try to track the movements of this couple in this rapidly expanding investigation. Yeah, and what people would like to know is, uh, is there a broader, broader risk to the public? Well, obviously, people here very worried about what's gone on. It seems as though uh, the lot of the sites that uh, I was at in the last poisoning in Salisbury are still sealed off. The ZZ restaurant, the Bishop's Mill, as this decontamination process starts. And what's tricky about the process, though, is it's very hard to identify where exactly the agent was used last time. It wasn't like the Litvinenko poisoning, where the police officers could track the radiation through London and then decontaminate. It's not possible to really know where the agent got to when it was used against the scripples. So the advice here is that uh, that uh, you, if you are in the areas that the couple were in that have now been sealed off from about 8 p.m. on Friday, wash anything that you were wearing, wash any items that you had with you, and then dispose of the cloths and the tissues that you've used to wash them. Police saying that no one is, needs to present themselves to medical services at the moment. Uh, the advice simply is to not pick up any sort of strange objects found and the chief medical officer trying to reassure people that they are not in any imminent danger. But there will obviously be questions now as to how thorough this decontamination process has been. All right, thank you for keeping us updated on that investigation. What's going on in Amesbury? Vincent McAvinney there. Thanks. Now, Angela Merkel has made a TV appearance to deny suggestions that she betrayed her own values on immigration. The German Chancellor told ARD it was absolutely not true that she transformed herself from being the refugee chancellor to the sealed borders chancellor after agreeing to setting up immigration transit centers on the frontier with Austria. Well, let's uh, go to Berlin now and talk to our correspondent Jessica Salt. Jessica, can you tell us more about what uh, she said about this? Well, Angela Merkel very much on the defensive yesterday in the German parliament, where opposition leaders very quick to point out the U-turn she's made on her migration stance. And also in this television interview where she defended her migration policy moving forward, also saying it was in Germany and Europe's best interest. And she said that uh, the future of the free movement of people within the Schengen area in Europe would not be compromised. But many people, of course, point out that these transit centres that she's agreed to with her conservative allies down in Bavaria would necessitate that the 
border there in Bavaria between Germany and Austria be closed off for the transit centres to be to work successfully, meaning, of course, that it would be uh, blocking a, a border between two Schengen countries. Um, of course, Angela Merkel's also come into criticism for agreeing to these so-called transit centres. In this interview yesterday, she said that they were not the kind of prisons that people imagine them to be and that asylum seekers would only uh, be in them for about 48 hours. But, of course, questions remain then about where these asylum seekers would then go afterwards. Of course, her interior minister, Horst Seehofer, has in recent weeks uh, brought up the very contentious idea of anchor centres, which would be uh, centres where asylum seekers would stay for longer uh, within Germany whilst they had their asylum procedures processed. So still lots of questions remain about around Angela Merkel's migration policy. She will be meeting the Hungarian leader, Viktor Orban, in the chancery here behind me uh, today. Of course, Merkel and Orban at one point were in opposite poles when it came to the divide on migration in Europe. M uh, Merkel representing the humanitarian liberal response back in 2015 and Orban the nativist anti-migrant response. But of course, Orban is meeting a different chancellor today. She's been had her hand forced on migration and been forced to bend to the demands of her conservative allies in Bavaria. And I think Orban's aware of this. Ahead of the meeting today, he said he would be open to bilateral talks with Angela Merkel on migration, something which is a change in stance from the Hungarian leader. But I think he knows that Angela Merkel is not in the kind of position to make demands on him on migration that she was a few months ago. And Jessica, uh, so one big meeting uh, is going to happen there behind you. But uh, Angela Merkel is also meeting Theresa May, I, I guess, Brexit on the agenda then. Yes, as Orban is leaving the Chancellery today, Theresa May will be quickly uh, going into the Chancellery for talks with Angela Merkel on the progress of Brexit. Theresa May hoping to get some support from Angela Merkel because Theresa May will be facing uh, crunch talks on Friday with cabinet ministers back in the UK. Um, now, Downing Street, ahead of this meeting, outlined a plan for a uh, trade moving forward between the EU and the UK, including a facilitated customs agreement, they call it, which would see the UK being able to place its own tariffs on goods imported into the UK um, and also that regulations when it comes to trade with, between the UK and the EU would remain more or less similar. But uh, it seems that Theresa May is unlikely to find a very conciliatory Angela Merkel today. Uh, there's been a lot of concern in the German government and also German industry about the very sluggish process of, uh, of Brexit so far. And also Merkel, of course, very concerned about the rise of far-right populism in Europe and anti-European sentiment. The, the mood from the German government is they don't want the UK to be seen to be getting any kind of easy deal when it comes to Brexit. All right. Thank you for that, uh, Jessica Saltz in Berlin there. Now, going back to the topic of migration, NGOs are now saying that there is a political crackdown that's stopping them from rescuing migrants in the Mediterranean, with Malta now grounding a search and rescue plane. Alex in the Cube has this story. So as you know, we here in the Cube, we've been tracking every development of this story as this summer has claimed the lives of over a thousand people trying to cross the Mediterranean. Well, NGOs are now saying the actions of Malta are akin to trying to stop an ambulance reaching the scene of a road traffic accident. That is a strong tone coming from NGOs. So let me just run you through the latest development. This is the privately operated Moonbird aircraft. It's run by the uh, German search and rescue charity Sea-Watch. Now, this aircraft, they say, has been flying out of Malta for over a year, filing flight plans and being approved. And it's been used to spot people at sea in distress. They say about 1,000 people would have drowned had it not been for this aircraft being able to see what was going on and to direct rescue efforts. Well, now, as of yesterday, they sent this tweet saying that the aircraft has been grounded. This has been confirmed as well by the Reuters news agency. They're saying the Maltese authorities have grounded this aircraft. And in a statement that they showed us, that they received on email from uh, an organization called DC Aviation who arrange aircraft registration, this is the line that the Maltese are apparently giving them. No permit will be issued for any search and rescue operation unless this is done on behalf of Malta or a request by a neighboring country. Now this the NGO sees as a direct political attack on their civil sea rescue. And this is the response they gave me to Malta's stance. You cannot say like an aircraft is polluting with smugglers. An aircraft is just searching for people in distress. And this is clear um, uh, search and rescue only. So um, uh, to ground this aircraft is nothing else than hindering rescue workers. It's kind of the same thing as if you stop uh, an ambulance from going to a, uh, to a road traffic accident. Um, if you would do this um, to stop an ambulance, you would end up in Kurt. And this should also be the case for the authorities that now um, uh, stop rescue assets from doing their duty at sea. 
Well, let's not forget, at the same time that their aircraft has been grounded, their boat, Sea Watch 3, has also been denied permission to leave a Maltese port. So I put some specific questions to the Maltese, asking on what grounds this vessel is being refused permission to leave and on what grounds specifically the aircraft is being refused to take off. Now, rather than answer those specific questions about the two, they sent me a press release from last week about the boat, but they did send me this statement about the aircraft. Uh, I just want to show you this. They're saying Malta's search and rescue authority does not request any surveillance missions by third parties to be conducted within its search and rescue region and flight information region. Then they went on to say as well, just in a second thing, furthermore, Malta's civil aviation department is not the competent authority to authorise such operations either uh, in their airspace or elsewhere. So the Maltese taking a strong stance on the aircraft, but they ignored a request to come on the programme. They ignored a request to give me specific answers about the legal basis of why this aircraft is grounded and why that ship is stopped. So this discussion is ongoing. Let us not forget that at the moment another NGO is back in court today in Malta. Mission uh, Lifeline, which docked there last Thursday, the ship was impounded and the crew are now appearing in court. The Maltese accusing them of breaking rules and hindering international rescue efforts, particularly those led by the Libyan Coast Guard. And the Aquarius, operated by SOS Mediterranean, which was at the centre of a huge row when Italy closed its borders and eventually uh, Spain let them in. Well, they're saying that now they are thinking twice about heading back out to sea because of this political situation. So it's a deadly summer and it's fair to say that the relations between NGOs and EU governments are at a historic low. Tessa. All right, thank you for that and for following this story so closely, Alex and the Cube team. Thanks. And uh, still to come for you on the program, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo prepares to leave for North Korea today, hoping to agree a roadmap for its nuclear disarmament. But first, let's take a short break. A recap of your top story on Good Morning Europe, a new twist to a growing poisoning mystery in the UK. Two British citizens are critically ill after they were exposed to what authorities say is the same nerve agent that struck a former Russian spy and his daughter in March. Even more troubling, this new poisoning happened just a few kilometers away from Salisbury, where Sergei and Yulia Skripal were attacked. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo prepares to leave for North Korea today, hoping to agree a roadmap for the country's nuclear disarmament. NBC's Hans Nichols spoke to Euronews about the importance of the trip. The goal of Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's trip to North Korea is to figure out if the North Koreans are serious. They're going to want to get specific about just what Kim Jong-un agreed to in that Singapore summit. Now, this is Pompeo's first trip to North Korea since the summit. Overall, it's his third. On Sunday, there was a negotiating team for a short meeting that took place there in the denuclearized zone. But you talk to officials across the government, and they say that this trip is really the test to see whether or not the Kim Jong-un regime is serious about denuclearizing. All throughout this process, there have been great concerns inside the Pentagon and the intelligence community as well, outside experts as well, wondering whether or not the North Koreans truly are going to denuclearize. Now, there's been an intelligence reporting by NBC News confirmed by The Washington Post that the North Koreans continue to increase their nuclear program, their fissile material. Now, the question is, are they doing that to basically bolster the negotiating position, or do they have no intention of dismantling their nuclear program? That's something that Pompeo, formerly at the CIA, is going to have to figure out in face-to-face -face negotiations. Now, from the administration side, we've heard from John Bolton. He, of course, is the National Security Advisor. He has talked about getting all this denuclearization done in a year's time. That's a radically truncated timeline that what experts say, or even the Trump administration said a couple of weeks ago, before it was two and a half years, independent experts say that you need 10 to 15 years. Bolton is saying that you can do this in one year. It gives you a sense of just how compressed this entire negotiating process is going to be. There was a hurry-up summit. Now we're going into hurry-up negotiations, and the stakes are high. Hans Nichols, NBC News, for Euronews in Washington. The situation in Gaza remains at crisis levels, and with that, it brings far more problems than just security. The economic impacts have led to widespread poverty. Sasha Vakulina has the story. 1.8 million Palestinians in Gaza remain locked in, denied free access to the remainder of the territory and the outside world. That is according to the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. 
More than half of them live in poverty on less than four euros per day. The Gaza economy has been devastated since the 2007 blockade. Economist Moen Rajab says there are official estimates of the unemployment rate in the Gaza Strip reaching between 43 and 44 percent, with the youth unemployment at 50 to 60 percent. As a result of the blockade, there are no job opportunities. All doors to any productive or developmental work are closed, thus the employment opportunities have greatly reduced. Gaza Sky Geeks is the Mercy Corps funded tech accelerator that operates inside blockaded Gaza. Sayed Habib says working remotely is a solution. Working remotely is a way of life for anyone with certain skills who can deliver them online. We all live here, see and suffer from surroundings. University graduates face daily a suffocating siege that has destroyed most of the opportunities. There are no new jobs at all, and opportunities are gradually diminishing. This is what Gazans say about working remotely. I'm a university student. I know that when I graduate, I won't have a job opportunity because I see all former graduates still unemployed. I'm at home. I just need a laptop, electricity, internet, a cell phone. These are basic needs. I can't work without them. So we face many difficulties here because of the lack of electricity or internet. Some years ago, the UN warned that Gaza is expected to be unlivable by 2020. It now says the living conditions are deteriorating even further and faster than predicted. Sasha Vakulina. Your news. And still ahead for you, a demonstrator tried to scale the Statue of Liberty in New York. Well, we find out why. And over in the queue. Yes, in case you missed it, could this be the strangest climate change theory we've heard? But first, a short break. Welcome back to Good Morning Europe. Now, our next story, the unalienable right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Those are celebrated on July the 4th, America's Independence Day. Well, demonstrators in New York use the opportunity to call for better treatment of illegal immigrants. NBC's Reema Ellis has the story. A stunning security breach at the Statue of Liberty. An unidentified woman managing to scale Lady Liberty amid heightened security for the holiday and refusing to leave. As a precaution, police evacuated all tourists from Liberty Island. Earlier in the day, authorities arrested seven protesters with a group called Rise and Resist after they displayed a banner reading Abolish ICE at the statue. On its Facebook page, the group demands President Trump reunite families, halt deportations, and end detention as a deterrent. After a standoff that lasted for hours, police finally reached the woman and began the process of bringing her down. Rahima Ellis reporting there. Now, our next story, an Iranian general has got people talking about a somewhat unique theory on climate change. Alex, can you tell us more? People talking in both Iran and Israel, Tessa. Yes, it could be the strangest theory on climate change we've heard. Comments attributed uh, to the Iranian general in a press conference have got people talking. This uh, is the brigadier general from Iran, and he has blamed recent water shortages and climate change in Iran on Israel and an unnamed neighboring country stealing Iran's clouds. Now, there's a very serious issue, which is the water protests in Iran, but these comments have been widely mocked in Israel and in Iran. I want to bring you up some of the tweets from Israel. This one here showing a man trying to catch a cloud in a jar, saying special Israeli Mossad agent stealing hashtag Iran's clouds in action um, as well. Um, the uh, Iranians as well making a serious point that these kind of comments are deflecting from state failures to address the water shortages. This one here saying developing a conspiracy theory is the best strategy to justify failure. Other people saying, well, if there's a science of stealing clouds, that's Nobel Prize worthy. So is this a daft theory? Is it a deflection? Or is this the general effectively failing to address a very serious issue? What are your thoughts? You can let us know using hashtag the cube. Really interesting theory there. Thanks, Alex, uh, for that. And thank you for joining us in Good Morning Europe. Do stay with your news for all of the top stories throughout the day. And we'll leave you with today's no comment, which shows the French President Emmanuel Macron sampling the culture of Nigeria.